Hello everyone and welcome to Broadband Basics for Public Libraries. I'm Brenda Haug and I'll be facilitating today's session. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We are using ReadyTalk. And those of you who are, have attended webinars with us before, this will be review, but we do have some people joining us for the first time. In ReadyTalk, all the lines are muted except for my line and Kieran's line, our presenter today. But you can use the chat, which is in the lower left-hand corner, and ask questions at any point or just weigh in on things that's in that way too. A couple of troubleshooting tips. One thing, if you lose your Internet connection or if this room freezes up where you can see the PowerPoint slides, that sort of thing, if it freezes up, the best way to fix that usually is just to close out and then come back in. Go back to the email with the, the link to the room and come back in that way. Um, hopefully you can hear me using just the speakers on your computer, but there is a phone number available too, and we can share that in the text chat if you need it. This session is being recorded and we'll make the archive available on the TechSoup website. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email, and we'll send that out later this afternoon. And that will include a link to the recording. It will include the PowerPoint slides. And then it will also include any of the resources that we talk about today. So there are a number of websites that we're going to talk about. Don't worry about trying to get the address. We will include that in the follow-up message that goes out later today. And if you're on Twitter, the hashtag for today is just TechSoup. Okay, so again, this is Broadband Basics for Public Libraries. Our special guest is Kieran Hickson. Kieran, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi there. I'm Kieran Hickson. I work at the Colorado State Library. And I'm really excited to talk about broadband and, and uh, different Internet stuff that we can do at the library. And, Keeping yeah. it simple. Glad to have you here, Karen. Karen has done a lot with the TechSoup project uh, over the years and is very good at um, explaining things and very good at thinking about things from a small library perspective too. In the chat, you've probably already noticed messages from Stephanie Girding and Sarah Washburn. They will both be assisting in chat today. So again, ask questions at any point. If you're having tech difficulties, let them know and they can help there too. But they're They'll be in the text chat helping us throughout the session. Okay, so today's agenda. We have a lot we're going to cover. I'm going to talk a little bit about TechSoup, just introduce you to that if it's new to you. And then the content for the day is really broadband basics. And we have lots of things we want to cover with that. And you'll notice the last bullet item there is lots of time for questions from participants. So again, feel free to ask them throughout the questions that you have, and we'll do our best to address as many of them as we can during the webinar. And then ones that we don't get to, we can address in the follow-up message that goes out too. So I'll tell you a little bit about TechSoup. TechSoup is a nonprofit that exists to help other nonprofits and libraries make the most of technology. And many of you may be familiar with TechSoup already because of the technology donation program. And through that, libraries and nonprofits have access to a catalog with donated products from Microsoft, from Adobe, from Cisco, from Symantec. So TechSoup.org is the address, and we'll send that in the follow-up message too. But if you haven't checked out TechSoup.org lately, it has a new look, just updated to a, a new website with the new year. There's a special section of TechSoup that is for libraries, TechSoup for libraries. And that has, in addition to information about the donated technology, it has information on the webinars that we do. It has blog posts that are about libraries and technology. And it has spotlights that are featuring stories, libraries and technology stories from around the country. So I'll include that in the follow-up message too. Today's session is a part of a series of webinars we're doing for the EDGE benchmarks. And the EDGE project, this is a, it's a coalition of library and, and non-library organizations to working together to develop public access computing benchmarks. And it includes TechSoup, it includes Web Junction, um, it includes the Public Library Association, some state libraries, and working together and getting lots of feedback from, from libraries 
on these benchmarks. And so this is one of the webinars in, in support of that project. And we'll send more information about that in the follow-up message too. Okay, well with that, that's a quick intro to TechSoup, and we'll send you lots of info in the, in the follow-up message too. But let's go ahead and dive into our topic for the day, which is broadband basics. And we're going to start with a poll. And um, what we're asking here is on a scale of 1 to 5, how would you rate the speed of your library network? Is it way too slow, which would be a 1? Is it very fast, which would be a 5? Is it 3 normally fine? Where would you rank the, the speed of your library network? I'll give you a minute just to weigh in on that one. Okay, just a few more. So it looks like it's a lot of it's normally fine, but sometimes it's a little slow for most folks. Yeah. Yep, normally fine seems to be the seems to be the most popular answer. Yep. And then very fast. A few people weighing in saying very fast. Which is lucky. Okay, good. Well we're gonna talk about um we're gonna talk about speed a lot throughout this session. So that gives us a feel for where how everyone is feeling about the speed of their network right now. Okay, well again, Kieran um, is here with us to talk about broadband, and I think I'll, I'll let you kind of take over, Kieran, and talk about this a little bit, just what broadband is, and start with some basic definitions. Alrighty, so a lot of times, I mean, you'll hear, you know, like broadband is, is like a wide range of frequencies, and it's like, well, that's nice. What does that mean? Um, and if you think about it, I like to think about it as like a, a freeway or or a one lane road, and basically what they they mean by the broadband is is that there's there's space there for more than one thing to be happening at a time. So there's like more lanes. You know, there could be a a truck in one lane and a car in another lane, and it's just that's all it really means is there's a more range in the frequencies that that it can use. I like that. And then bandwidth is different from broadband? Right. I mean, yeah, to, to a degree. Now we're talking about um, adding a, an, a level of time. So now it's not how many lanes are there on the freeway. It's how fast can I get from Denver to Colorado Springs. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, helpful. I think analogies are good. Okay, and then these were some of the types of connections, and we'll uh, share a resource that explains these too. But um, I was curious, if people know, if you know what type of connection that you have at your library, would you share that with us in the chat? And one of the things with this, um, a lot of times you'll have a wire, a DSL coming or sometimes cable coming into the library, and then you'll have a little router that makes a wireless signal. That's different than a type of connection that's called wireless, um, like to to your your internet service provider. Um, I live on the side of a mountain, and there's no cables coming anywhere near the house for electric or internet. And I actually have a wireless radio link between the internet service provider 13 miles line of sight from a tower to the house. So that's that's kind of the difference between the wireless that's written up here and DSL with like wireless access. So people are starting to weigh in and it looks like we've got a little bit of everything. We've got a lot of people with DSL, some people with fiber, some people with cable, some people with both or more than one. Okay, a lot of How about dial up? Are you still seeing libraries um with dial up in Colorado, Karen? I know I know of one. Um and I also know of one that's just on a, a satellite connection. Okay. No one that we have 
who has commented yet has said dial up. But. Yay! <laughs> Getting there, yeah. We've sold our horses and carts. Okay. Well, you may have noticed in the message that went out, the registration confirmation and reminders that were sent out yesterday and today, there was a note in there saying, please run a speed test before the session. And I know maybe not everyone had a chance to do that, but if you didn't have a chance to run it before, that might be something to do after too. And it will be interesting, I think, in light of what Karen's going to talk about with what, what those speeds mean. Um, just curious though, did you have a chance to run a speed test for today's webinar and, and jot down your download and upload speed? So we've got a lot of people saying yes, Most that they did have a chance to run that, and then some people who didn't. So I know um, Kieran recommends that it's a, it's a good thing to do just to, to check in and see how much speed you're actually getting, what speed you're actually at. So if you didn't have a chance to do it before the webinar, we'll include that again in the follow-up resources info on, on how to do that. And the one that we shared is just one that Colorado has been using but there are other, other speed tests that are out there too. Okay. All right. I, I also noticed a lot of folks said they had a T1. And um, I wanna, I'll talk about that too. So a lot of times you'll hear, like, you know, you know you have a, have broadband and they, and perhaps your internet service provider says, well, I'm going to run a T1 line. Blah, blah, blah. And, and you don't really know like, what that means as far as speed goes. Um, it's, it's pretty basic metric, kind of, you know, kilo, mega, giga, you know, keeps in those, that scheme of things. And if you break it down really simply, we know how like computers run on zeros and ones. Each one of those, either one or zero, is a bit. And that's like the smallest measurement of information. And then eight of those little bits, eight, you know, like ones or zeros, make a byte, which is the same as a character. So like if you type in the letter A, that's eight little little bits of information. So when we talk about kilobits per second, so that's 1,000 little ones or zeros per second. And of course, a megabit is 1,000 kilobits, kind of goes up from there. Um, so if you think about you know, each letter that you type being, or each pixel on a screen being eight bits, you know, it adds up pretty quick, you know, a, a, a thousand of them isn't a whole lot, really. Uh, and that's kind of where it's coming from. The, a kilobit is equal to about one page of text. Another resource that was in that reminder email that went out yesterday and today was an infographic that that Kieran and maybe others worked on for the state of Colorado too, and I really liked the infographic, and I think it helped me r with wrapping my brain around and thinking about how to explain these things to others. So, I've got a couple Great. of slides that are from that infographic. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, I guess if you think about, like, if you typed a hundred characters onto a piece of paper. And, and you put 100 pieces of paper into a file folder. So each file folder has 100 pieces of paper that have 100 typed characters on each piece of paper. Um, and you put the folders into a file cabinet, and the file cabinet held 1,000 files. If you had 100 of those file cabinets in a room, that would be one gigabyte of data. I don't know if that's easy to visualize or not, but um, 
if you think about one gigabyte of data, so a hundred of those file cabinets in a room, um, it's, it's quite a, quite a bit of information. I know I know some of you said you had a T1. So if you're thinking about a T1 connection, that's a hundred or 1.54 megabits per second um, going through a computer. And if if you think, okay, a T1 is like 1.5 rounded up, uh, rounded down, uh, 1.5. So if if you had just one computer running on that T1, you know, it would be simple to download. Yeah, it'd be, <laughs> yeah, it'd, be it'd be, you know, your your Mad Max movie that runs about an hour and a half that uh, isn't high def. You could download that in like eight minutes. That's pretty quick, you know. Um, Let's say that you have a T1 coming into the library and you have more than one computer in the library, which is probably the case. Maybe you have, you know, 12, right? And then you're looking at mm, you know, 20 seconds for a website page to download. You're looking at uh, <laughs> like 106 hours for the Mad Max movie to download. It's... It gets used up really fast, especially, you know, letters are one thing, you know, an A is, is eight little, you know, zeros or ones, but when you start talking about a picture and all the pixels, or you start talking about music and all the sounds, you start using up quite a bit of that. Yeah, it was interesting when I was doing some research trying to find good resources for this webinar. Um, some of the things I found were from you know ten years ago, and they talked about video and things like that as the exception. You know, those were things that people were rarely doing. But now people are wanting to stream stream things live all the time. That's become I think we're just moving into more and more bandwidth hungry um, types of things that we're wanting to do online. Yeah, indeed. Um, I mean, I can't imagine. A library where people aren't looking at YouTube or or something like that on one of the computers at least. Okay, so this is the question that that everyone seems to have is just how much speed is enough speed? In the beginning we asked people right. just, just how they felt qualitatively, how they felt about their internet speed if they had if it felt fine or if it was really fast or if it was way too slow, but technically speaking or mathematically speaking, how much speed is, is enough speed? <laughs> so the, the, with the analogy of cars going down the freeway, there's, there's two ways that the traffic is usually going. And so there's uploads and downloads. And I think for most of what we use, we're downloading information. We're getting information from outside and bringing it to our computer. Um, and there's sometimes when we're uploading, like if you're sending an email, technically your email is going up and out. But just to talk about download really fast. Um, so I like to think of it this way. If I had a library with a T1 and I had, oh, I don't know, say... 10 patron access computers and maybe three uh, staff computers. Then I have to figure out, and I have a little wireless router, so my rule of thumb is for every like three public access computers that I see, I add one for a wireless pers person, you know, whether that's somebody showing up with their smartphone or, or what have you. So um, if I had the ten staff computer or ten public access computers, three staff computers. Um, I would add another four or so to that for wireless, and um, now I'm looking at seventeen computers, right? And if I have a, a T1 coming in and I'm dividing it, I'm dividing that uh, one point five uh, by seventeen suddenly each one of those computers is only getting 
90 kilobits per second, which is really slow. Um, so, and what I mean by really slow is, is now it's taking probably 25 seconds, 30 seconds for a web page to come up. Right, and, and I know 30 seconds doesn't seem like a whole lot, you know, <laughs> people can be patient, but 30 seconds is almost an eternity if you're waiting for a web page to load, in my opinion. So how much speed is enough? I would say like a minimum of, of 500 kilobits for a download speed on each public access computer or for each user. And I would think more like 750 would be like nice, a nice number to hit. And if you have more than like one megabit or like a thousand kilobytes, awesome. You know, sign me up because I want to use your library. Okay, so your math was to add up every public access computer and staff if they're on the same network, and then you said right. one add for each public or for every three public access computers, figure that you have a wireless user. Okay, and then right. divide the speed that you have by that. And okay, I know that's kind of scary to do math like this, um, but basically you're you're adding up how many people or how many computers basically have a straw. And then you're you're figuring out how much water you have coming into the library and how many people are going to be sucking at it with the straw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of a weird analogy, sorry. <laughs> no, but it makes sense. Okay, any questions on that? Again, weigh it in the chat if you have questions on that and we can can talk about that more too. But this is one thing I wanted to talk about is this is something that I think is also shifting. We talked about how, you know, ten years ago video was the rare exception and now it's just that's streaming streaming T V shows are something lots of people watch. But um, upload speed. I know when I did this test on my home network that my download speed was fine, but my upload speed was very, very slow. <laughs> so why why does right. this matter or what um, I think this is becoming more of a something to pay attention to, I guess, as people are doing different sorts of things on the on the web. But what do you think about this, Kieran? So the more we're we're creating content, the more we're learning to use the internet as a, like a tool to do something, the more we're uploading, right? It's no longer um, just a receiving information kind of scenario. Now we're, 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 we're shooting YouTube videos with our phones and uploading them at, at libraries. You know, it's, who knows, maybe cats became more interesting and, and now we have to document every part of it. But we're creating more content and so upload speeds are getting more important. Um, there's still usually maybe half of what your download speed is. It's it's kind of the, the passing lane on the uphill, you know, uh, if you're going up. I know in Colorado we have a lot of mountains, so that, that perhaps came to me. But for upload speeds, you know, if you're getting at least 125 or so kilobits upload speed, that's kind of a minimum, I think, that you'd want to see now. Um, 250, you're feeling a lot better. 500, awesome. And that's all kilobits. So if you did some speed tests and you were feeling like, or you were noticing even just from people using the, the web in the library, you wanted more upload speed, is that the kind of thing you can have a conversation with your Internet service provider and negotiate getting more more upload or faster upload speed? Or how does this work when you're actually communicating with the Internet service provider? They're tied together. You're not going to be able to necessarily negotiate an upload speed without negotiating a download speed. But you can really check your speed altogether. If the service provider says they're providing you with a T1, so um, 1.54 megabits 
per second, right? And you test it in the morning when you come in on one computer. And granted, there'll be a little, little teeny, teeny bit of loss at your router and at your, you know, switches or whatever. And you know that there's nobody else in the library using a computer and you've looked in the parking lot and there aren't, you know, 20 people hitting your wireless from the parking lot. And you do, you know, twice a week you do a test and you're not getting those speeds that the um, internet service provider said you would, you know, it, uh, that's something to pay attention to and really talk talk to them about. A lot of times in a contract they'll say up to, we'll provide you with up to a T1, you know, and to know what you're really getting. I mean, I don't think we would enter a lot of contracts, you know, with like say a book provider and say, we, we will provide you with up to 20 books a month. Well, no, I want 20 books a month, thank you. We're not going to pay for something we might not get. Um, so it's good to keep track of that kind of thing and figure it out. Um, if you're getting, let's say you're getting your, your T1 and, you, and you're in the mornings when you check it, it seems great. And then say about 3 o'clock when school gets out and all, all the folks come in and there's, you know, a bunch of people using the internet and, and playing different games or watching YouTube. And then also test your internet connection speed then, you know, maybe once or twice a week and see you know, what it's looking like when a lot of people are hitting your network. Um, again, my rule of thumb for adding a wireless person for every three computers might be a little low, I think, you know, and that really depends on the area you live in. If you want to think about you know, how many computers, how many people you see with their own devices, how many people are coming in and using your, your Wi-Fi, you might want to change that. Um, so it's, yeah, it's one thing to have a network that has, you know, a T1. And it's a little, it looks a little different when you have 30 computers on that same network. Okay, so we were so, able to address a couple of questions that have come up that are kind of around this thing, absolutely. This, these topics. Um, one per asking for a reminder of what a T1 is. What does that miss? I mean, what does that so mean? So a T1, a T1 is 1.544 megabits per second. So 1,544 kilobits per second. Okay, and then... And I know rather than selling you the speed of saying, oh, we'll give you a 1.54 megabit per second connection, a lot of internet service providers will say a T1 or we'll give you a T1N or we'll give you a T1, you know, or T2. And you have to really kind of decipher what they mean by that. Yep. Okay, and then um, can we review the, the math for um, this again? So you said... Okay, so you've got all of your public access computers, all of your staff computers, and then for every three public access computers, is it, or just for every three computers? For every three computers that are using, like, unless you have, if you have two connections coming into your library and one's for staff and one's for patrons, okay. then don't add the staff ones. But for everything that you know is using this one network, add up all the computers, regardless of who uses it, mm -hmm. um, public or staff, and for every three of those, add one wireless, mm -hmm. if not more, depending on your area or what you think the use is. Again, that's just been my rule of thumb. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and then when you divide your bandwidth that you have, um, then what is right. it that you're shooting for? What would be a good amount so, to have per computer? I, I think it's a, a kind of a minimum that you would be looking for would be about 500 kilobits per second per computer. And um, at 500 kilobits per second, they're waiting about five seconds for a web page to load. Um, they could download uh, one, one whole book, maybe off your overdrive or whatever, um, in about 15 seconds. They could download that 
Mad Max movie that's an hour and a half long and not in HD in about 26 hours. And if they're there, still there for 26 hours, you know, that's problematic. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned um, that some libraries, and we even had some people say this in the chat too, that there's a setup this way, but that some libraries have a separate network for staff and a separate network for public computers. Is right. that something that you see a lot or that you recommend? It is something actually that I would recommend it to be to have a separate network. And I, I know a lot of times, you know, there has to be a little crossover, especially when it comes to like your print system, like if you have one copier, you know, both the patrons and the um, staff need to be able to use it. But that you're able to set that up. Um, keeping them uh, separate can really help if something goes wrong. Um, there's usually less staff, so you can have a slightly less of a connection. Although what the staff uses is usually high use. If your ILS, if your CERC system is, is in the cloud or or something like that, that might be something that's really important that, you know, just because there's 10 kids watching YouTube videos and, you know, you still want to be able to circulate, uh, use the software to circulate a book or check something in and out in, in a quick, quick fashion, so. This is lots of good stuff coming in, and Walt has shared some things from, from his library. Um, he brought up the... Okay computers and the age of computers and how that can, you know, they can be very slow too. So um, right. you've got the bandwidth that impacts how fast people are accessing things, but then also the speed of the computer is impacting mm -hmm. things too. So can you maybe say a little bit more about that connection or what what matters there, I guess? Right. So back to our freeway analogy. Let's say I have a, you know, a seven-lane highway and I'm going to jump in my vehicle and get from Denver to Colorado Springs. If I'm in a 1972 VW van, I'm just not going to be able to go as fast as if I'm in that Porsche. It's just kind of how it is. Um, I think there's a lot of good reasons to, you know, to keep the VW van and to fix it up as best you can. But at some point, you know, you have to realize you're driving an egg beater. And that's just that. Um, yeah, painted with <laughs> flowers and peace symbols. Absolutely. So, you know, if, if, if your computer is slowing down your patron's experience, that's definitely something to consider. You, that's not optimal, to say the least. Um, if they're able to bring in their their own laptops, that's wonderful. But for those who don't have it, you know, you're immediately putting them in in a in a slower vehicle. You're immediately, you know, not letting there be any a good access for them. I try to think about keeping a computer going for three or four years, and in in non-library tech land, that's like an eternity. But, you know, four years, you should be looking into at least upgrading what you have, at, at currently anyway. Technology changes so fast, I, I have no idea what next year will bring. Okay. Um, Karen, do you see a question in the chat from Cheryl? I'm going to put it in the chat too. Um, to advise a new library director who's seeking broadband, tell that person to add up all access points and multiply them? Is that, let's see. So one megabit would be great. Um, I think that would be, I mean, definitely the the shoot for it um, for a new library director. If you can get 750 kilobits per second for, for each device um, using the internet, that's fine. That's a good medium amount. Um, again, the more the better. In lots of areas, uh, you can't. Uh, your 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 internet service provider cannot provide enough. It depends on really where you live. Mm -hmm. I think on that and what your service provider can get you. Um, but definitely, if 
if you have the availability from the internet service provider and you have the financial wherewithal, if you can get one megabit per second to each patron computer or staff computer, whatever's using your network, that's great. I think the um, federal government recently was saying that they wanted anchor institutions, like libraries are, to have a gigabyte connection. Mm -hmm. um, that simply isn't possible where I live, um, but I think is possible in, in more urban areas. It's starting to be, yeah. Is there anyone on who has ultra high speed internet so that can kind of Gigabit, gigabit connectivity. Okay, there, it's coming. So by June. Awesome. Okay, and then yeah. So I think it's just certain communities that it's in at this point. Um, right. But that's that's exciting to think about the the potential of that. Okay, then we have someone on from Chattanooga, and that is one of the places yet where you, you read about it. So that's great. Right. Again, if you have less than 500 kilobits per second coming to each uh, terminal, if you want to, you know, that's something to look into, and that's something, and you can, you know, start using that as a a talking point for getting more from your mm -hmm. your stakeholders or your ISP. Might be a good point. You just mentioned talking to stakeholders. And we wanted to spend some time talking about um, communication about broadband. And when you registered for the webinar, people weighed in on what you were most hoping to learn. And we were seeing a, a variety of things. We were seeing people who wanted help explaining things to non-techie people, so breaking things down, analogies and things like that. Um, and then people wanting help explaining things to, um, or communicating with tech people, so having understanding basic terms and how things work. And then people also saying that they wanted to convince others of the need for more, how to have those conversations, how to advocate for that. So curious which what are you? What are your biggest challenges? And I think on this one I set it up so you can choose more than one. As you communicate about broadband, talk to others, stakeholders, or other people that you talk to about the library's bandwidth. What are your challenges with that? Okay, let's take a couple more seconds for that and then we'll show the results. So communication challenges. What are your communication challenges as you talk to others about, about broadband? Okay, communicating with tech people, convincing others of the need for more. That seems to be the biggest. And then those who are weighing in and saying other, please please share share in the chat. And then a lot of you are saying everything, that all of those are, are challenges. So can we talk about that a little bit, Kieran, just how you how you communicate? Let's just go right down the list there. What what advice do you have for communicating with tech people? Well, I think I think a lot of tech people well, okay. I think a lot of tech people that come from outside of libraries um, are 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 not understanding what happens in libraries and what people are using the internet for. Um, they're you know like they're used to setting up things for businesses or corporations where it's really not expected that there's going to be a lot of people watching YouTube videos all day. Um, there's not a lot of game playing. There's not a lot of these kind of high use 
things going on. And so explaining, and, and a lot of times we shove a lot more computers in a smaller room than a lot of other people. Um, so explaining to the tech person, you know, I'm going to have 20 patron access computers available all day and look at, you know, how often I have people on this, you know, information here of how many times a day I have people using my internet, you know. I'm serving 100 people a day, right? So that they get the idea of how many people that you're really, really dealing with and the kind of things that they're going to be doing. And I think the kind of things they're going to be doing also helps convince people um, of, of the need for more. You know, you're looking at people who are um, perhaps scanning in a, uh, a document, uh, maybe their resume or a, a project, and up maybe photos and uploading it to something on the web to reformat it, to do some graphic design so that they can print it out, so that they can go get a job. So we're talking about economic development. Maybe they're, you know, doing other things, but there's definitely a need in our libraries, I think, for things, for things that do take a big amount of bandwidth. Um, communicating with tech people. Also, don't let them fool you. A lot of them, you know, just throw out numbers and they don't realize how much jargon they're using. Kind of like when I go home and I talk to my wife and I talk about weeding and, and different, or the ILS well, broke down and she has no idea what I'm talking about. Because we do this in libraries too. We throw around this jargon or these letters, well, the ALA and the PLA and the, you know, ILS companies are, the, you know, like, what? So, it's it's the same kind of thing. It's a profession. They have jargon. Um, and it's okay to, to not understand. I know we're in the business of figuring stuff out for ourselves and looking up information and, and knowing. And it's okay to be like, hey, what do you mean? You know, like mm -hmm. when you said, I can get you a 2015 high-speed internet, like 2015 is a what? You know, oh, the 20 is up, uh, download and the 15 is, is upload? Oh, okay. 15 watts. 20 watts. Are we talking, you know, kilobits or are we talking megabits, you know? It's okay to, to ask questions and to get an answer. I think that's, don't let them, don't let them, you know, run run by you really fast and not explain it to you. Something I've seen libraries too, too, do too is just get really familiar with their own network. So, you know, putting a, a post-it note on the router so you remember, you know, which one's the router and which one is the access point or whatever. You know, I think getting familiar with your own network in that way I think can help too so you really feel a little bit more on top of that. You're just oh, yeah. constantly learning. This is the kind of stuff where you can know a teaspoonful or you can know a, an ocean full. There's just, it's constantly learning, I think. But not being intimidated and by it and just asking questions, like you said, I think that's good advice. I mean, it's the same. It's the same process we have to go th go through. And when I worked at the John C. Fremont Library, I, I um, we had a tech closet, and it seemed I didn't know anything about it. It seemed really foreign to me, and we asked and we labeled everything so that I know if well the staff computers are working, and the internet for the patrons on that wall is working, but the internet over here on this wall doesn't work. You know which little box do I unplug and plug back in? And I labeled things with with. Uh, with tape and markers, and I also took a picture of it with my, my cell phone and placed it into a Word document, you know, like this picture, this thing is this, it does this, you know, it's somewhat time consuming, I guess, to, to organize things, mm -hmm. but once it's organized, it'll save you a lot of, lot of time when something goes wrong. And then, you know, it makes it easier when you're not there to, to help others, you're like, okay, open this Word program. You see that thing I took a picture of? That thing's called a router, or I don't even know what that thing's called. Who cares what that thing's called? Unplug it, plug it back in. Yeah. You know, you can show them a visual. Yeah, that kind of leads into explaining to non-tech. Some of that can help with that, having things labeled and using visuals. Any other advice on 
talking to people who are not um, not technical and explaining things related to the to broadband. Well, I think analogies are are something I fall back on. You know, like relating it to something that I understand helps me. You know, I know what it's like to get stuck in traffic, or I know what um, the set of of uh, Harry Potter books. I know how long, you know, how much space one set of Harry Potter books takes up. Um, and to think about data in that way, to think about it in terms of things that I can picture, you know, like that makes it easier for me. And then the next one was um, communicating the need for more. And this is a quote we were um, asking Ron Carley, who's involved with the EDGE project and is with um, ICMA, which is that the – Sarah might be able to tell me what that stands for in text chat – for city managers. And so we asked him just when librarians are in conversations or talking sure. about the need for more bandwidth, what are – from a city manager perspective, how to approach that. And this is his response was that managers are going to want to see the quantitative case made with some cost-benefit analysis. How much more does it cost us to go from X to Y and with what benefit? So Kieran, thinking about that and thinking about advocating, um, how do you show that? How do you show that kind of cost-benefit analysis? Right. So. The International City Managers Association, ICMA. Um, right. When I'm thinking about about what their what the town needs, when I'm thinking about my community and my library, I'm thinking about in Florence we have a lot of uh, small businesses that are antique stores. When they come into the library, often what they're doing is uploading a picture. Um, to uh, eBay or Etsy or one of those kinds of sites, typing in a description. Um, they're often checking their email uh, to see if anybody's bought anything that they're selling. They're doing banking. They're filling in their tax forms, their, their different uh, quarterly business taxes. Uh, they're, they're using those kinds of things on our internet. So if they're waiting, say, on my T1 line with 30 computers hooked to it, if they're waiting 45 seconds for one web page to load, or if they're waiting somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 minutes for a picture to upload, I'm wasting their time, you know? I mean, not that I'm wasting their time. It's a library. They, they came in. But that's the kind of being able to improve that connection is going to help them. It's going to help businesses in my town. And I think even just, and, and that's businesses, but even at the, the list of, um, of really simple digital literacy, uh, the more bandwidth we have, the more people that we have using the computers, the more folks that we're helping to interact with their community um, worldwide or, or locally. Um, I think that's really important. There was a family, or was it not family dollar, it was Dollar General that opened in Florence. And uh, they had an online only application. And we had a stream of people come in to, to get, to fill out that online application because there wasn't a, uh, a computer at the store, you know, where usually sometimes they have like a little one. Um, and a lot of people were asking me, to, like, can you print it out? You know, and it didn't print out very well. Um, and, and it was taking some time. And so I went and I thought, well, this is a great opportunity for me to partner with the Dollar General folks. And I went down there and asked the guy. And, and you know, I was like, hey, you know, a lot of people are coming in and filling out your application. It's online. You know, would you like to take this, you know, time? You could, you know, you could have a class. You could meet with the, you know, prospective employees, whatever. And he was like, yeah, no. If they can't fill out an online application, I don't want to hire them because they won't be able to use my cash register. Hmm. And... 
I was thinking it's a dollar store. Like everything's a dollar. How complicated could a cash register be? But <laughs> you know, like if if we're talking about keeping folks in our town employed, if we're talking about economic needs, if we're talking about keeping people in the workforce, if we're talking about jobs, if we're talking about the benefits to our community, bandwidth actually really plays a role. I mean, unless unless the world radically changes really quickly, whether you like it or not, most stuff is on the internet. Uh, in our, I don't know where, where everybody is, but around where I live, if you want a hunting license, it's online. If you want uh, to do your quarterly business taxes, they don't even take, they used to have a coupon book you'd fill out and take to the bank. That's all online now. It's, it's the way world, the world works. Okay, let's see if we've got any questions out there that we haven't addressed yet. Again, weigh in if you have anything to add to this in the chat about your experiences with advocating for more. I know a number of people talked about that their biggest issue with bandwidth is just money, that they um, they don't have the the budget to have more more broadband than they do. So are there things you can do in that case or any advice for them, Kieran? If you just you're you're maxed out on what you are spending is a, is as much as you can budget. Any any advice there or anything you've seen or, or heard about? There's a lot of interesting partnerships I think going on with schools and with um city halls. Um and other anchor anchor institutes institutions basically in your area. Um there's uh, often fiber going to uh, school district or schools, and if you're if you're close to that, if you're you know geographically physically close to to the school, it might not be that much to have fiber run to your library. There might be a, a middle mile provider, you know, of 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 broadband that would help do that project. Um, I know we've talked a lot about taking your connection and, and dividing it by the number of stuff, and so it's scary to think about, you know, dividing it by more stuff. But partnering with other people might give you the financial wherewithal to get a little, little more bandwidth. Um, the internet is becoming a, a very important service. I know some libraries will have maybe a DSL line and a cable line. Um, and looking for those kind of discounts, especially if you're dealing with a local company or there's a local ISP, local internet service provider, talking to them about you know what what you as an institution can provide and what kind of discounts they can ask about. There's also different government discount kind of things like E-rate, and I wouldn't call it a discount thing, but like a refund thing, I suppose. Um, and looking into whether you know, a little bit of paperwork on your end can, can save you significant amounts of cash. Okay. Um, Walt, who's in Michigan, shared in the text chat that Ironwood has lost startups, so his community has lost startups because of unreliable Internet service. So I think that I know I'm in Lawrence, Kansas, and we're pretty close to Kansas City, Kansas, and they have were selected as a Google City, so they're getting ultra high speed internet, and the mm. conversations that I see around that are all about the business opportunities that that creates. So it makes it a really attractive place for entrepreneurs. So there's definitely a connection there. I also saw a and question. If, oh, sorry. Uh -huh. and if you are, you know, in a position in a in a community where you're losing, you know, startups because of uh, poor internet connection. That's definitely something where you want to be partnering with the city hall, the chamber of commerce, the business people's association, or whatever you have in your area, and, and to look at it as a, as a community problem mm -hmm. and not just a library problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would almost be a fun webinar to do kind of a flip side to, you know, making do with the best you can get, but to looking at those communities like we have Chattanooga on where this ultra high speed has been, where it's available, where they have it, and looking at what possibilities that's created, I think that would be an interesting interesting um, perspective too, even if it's not available in all of our communities yet, just to give us that sense of what, 
what a difference it could make. Um, Robin had a question about fiber. So if fiber is available in the community, what are the benefits to switching to that? Um, well, I mean, speed, faster speed, more uh, scalable. So I know I, I was recently at a library where they had like a, a section of cables coming out of a wall thicker than my arm, and I, I'm not skinny, so I don't, <laughs> but an arm, it's big. Okay, <laughs> um, you, you know, and when you they had to have that many just because of the the nature of the material of the cable and how much it could literally physically handle. Whereas when you're talking fiber optic, you're, uh, one little cable can hold a lot more. So I don't know quite how to put that back in the analogy of the freeway, but it's like uh, a freeway that has nine million more lanes but doesn't take up any more space. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah. And it just allows for faster speed. Yeah. I think it's hard sometimes to think, to not just look at what's happening now and that, oh, that could be better, but also to realize that new new opportunities would present themselves with higher with higher speeds too, just um, new new opportunities would go with that. So it isn't just that what people are doing now would be more comfortable or faster. It would new things new things could happen. Right, and it's not like we're trying to turn, um, you know, libraries into these, just this internet thing. But if you think about what inter libraries have always provided, is is a connection to the world, and right now the way the world connects isn't, you know, the occasional book from some great philosopher that's been scribed out by uh, somebody who's, you know writing each copy by hand, you know. It's not even, we've invented the printing press. Now it's all on the internet. And for better or for worse, this is the way the future in the world is going. If we're going to provide our community with a way to not only get information from the world, but to be able to participate in what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. we're talking about internet speeds. And we're talking about providing that in libraries. Well, Kieran, um, we're almost at the top of the oh. hour again, and one of the things we're going to do is send out a follow-up message, and it will include any resources that we talked about today, but also we have other resources that we've put together, things like monitoring performance, managing bandwidth, some troubleshooting tips, a little bit more about ultra-high speed Internet, and just what that is, because again, I think that librarians can be part of the community conversation. So not just about looking at your community and choosing from the ISPs or getting the best deal from the ISP, but it really is thinking about what might potentially exist for your community. So we have lots of resources we're going to send for that. But um, Thanks so much, Kieran, for sharing, sharing your perspective. I know this is something you've been working on in Colorado, um, helping people with the, the BTOP Broadband Technology Online Program, is that right? Opportunity Program. Opportunity Program. Okay, great. So uh, you have lots of experience with kind of helping people take it to the next level, and that's, that's helped a lot in this session too. Um, we do have another bench, um, EDGE Benchmark webinar coming up next month. It's also a basic session like this one, and that one's on PC troubleshooting. And we'll have Joe from the Washington State Library. He'll be, he'll be talking us through some just basic PC troubleshooting tips in that session. So I hope you'll join us for that. I'll include registration information for that in the follow-up message too. So. And if anybody has any specific questions or confusion about what they're being told by their Internet service provider or any way I can help, please feel free to email me. I'm more than happy to be a resource. Okay. Well, thank you. That's generous. So we'll include Kieran's email address in the follow-up follow -up message too. Okay. Well, with that, I don't see any other questions. And um, just want to thank everyone for being here. Thanks for your good questions and for the good work you're doing. And we hope to see you at another webinar soon. You'll get a, a link to, or you'll get an evaluation form if you can share your thoughts on what 
how today's webinar was and then also your ideas for future webinars that will help us in our planning. So thanks again, Kieran, and thank you, Sarah and Stephanie, for helping out in the chat. Hope to talk to you again soon.